Hey YouTube, so this is the second episode about living with the monks in Nepal. And the way that it actually came about was, prior to my going to Nepal, I was a World Teach volunteer in a little country in the Pacific Ocean called Micronesia on a tiny island called Chuk. And so whilst I was there with another group of volunteers from all over the world, there was one in particular named Julia from the UK who had a friend in Nepal that was working for an NGO looking for volunteers to go to different monasteries and teach English to the monks there. And so it was nearing the end of that contract in Chuk when I did not want to return back to the USA that I then reached out to Julia's friend who put me in contact with Odzeb Monastery and was able to finagle it so that I had some place to go once I arrived in country, lodgings, boardings, and was basically set up upon arrival. All I had to do was get there. And so that's basically what I did. I went from Chuk, I don't remember what the connecting flights were, but there were certainly connecting flights to Kathmandu. And flying into Kathmandu International Airport was dropping in to, it felt like the top of the world. But it wasn't snowy or icy, it was actually brown, low built city, but very lovely in a way because it was so different. And then of course, when you get out, and you're in the airport there. It's a really cool, nice atmosphere inside. It just feels like you're in a far off part of the world. And myself, when I walked out of the airport, I was immediately surrounded by tons of taxi guys. And they were pretty desperate at the time, which I'll get into later. But I, and you should expect to have this happen to you too. As soon as you come out of those departure doors, there will be a lot of people trying to offer you a ride quite persuasively. And so that happened to me. People were sort of begging me to let them take me someplace in an uncomfortable manner. But again, there's a specific reason for it and I'll get to it in a later episode. But I pushed through that mass and sort of told them that I had a ride already and pointed towards the, the gate of the airport so that they would sort of leave me alone and focus on the other passengers that were coming out of the uh, terminal as well, or the doors of the airport. And so I happened to be walking towards the gate because I just was so uncomfortable by that mass of marauding taximen that there was a single, there was a couple taxis, but there was this one like in a row and there was a Nepalese man who was leaning up against it. And you know, he looked slick with nice pressed white shirt, blue jeans, black shoes, had like the red dot and everything, and he spoke good English, basically, and, and asked me if I was looking for a ride. And so it was the way that he came off being so genteel and, and smooth and friendly and clean, and his cab, you know, looked well-maintained and everything, that I decided, ah, he would be my taxi guy. And so when he came up to me, he was like, you know, where can I take you, friend? And I told him that I wanted to go to Adzam Monastery, which was in a place called Dalu. And he asked, you know, if, if he could see where it was on the Google Maps, and I showed him. And then he told me, basically, that because of the time of day it was and all the traffic, that by the time we got there, it would be nighttime already. And so I, you know, being some foreigner that's just coming into the country, did not feel it would be proper to just show up at some religious institution at nighttime and expect to, you know what I mean? It, it, it just seemed like it would be very inappropriate. And so he was very easily able to persuade me to be taken to a place called Tamil, 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 however you want to say it, district in Kathmandu, which is where he told me the Westerners go. And so I said, okay, like, let's go there. Because he, he said that he had a friend or a brother, a friend's brother or something that owned a hotel there, and I could stay the night. And then in the morning, he would take me to the monastery. And so, you know, he, again, seemed like a cool guy, young guy friendly, speaks good English with a Nepalese accent, and so I was like all for it, and I got into the cab with him, and we left out of that airport into a sea of chaos. It was absolute madness. I mean, if you've been to places like Bali then, or Bangkok, then you're familiar with that, but, you know, Kathmandu is is still that that same type. It was just lawless out there, and me, at that time, I had only been to the USA and then I went to Micronesia and so now this was the first time I had ever experienced anything like this. I had never been to Bali or Thailand or any of these things yet and so we went into this teeming mass of cars and scooters and bicycles and it was just so absolutely chaotic I could not believe it. It was like trying not to sort of panic because 
I just couldn't believe that we weren't going to have an accident like every second. You know, it's like my seatbelt was definitely on as we're in this capital city. And it was a low built capital city. Again, hot, very hot, like dusty. But you can see the Himalaya range like out in front of you. Really cool. Like very, very, very different. Really cool, though. And so that's what it was. That's what the vibe was like as soon as we started heading out into the traffic. And he was driving me to this place called Tamil District. And so him being so cool and myself, you know, liking to smoke marijuana while we were driving, because obviously in Micronesia, I found the what would become my, my weed guy through the taxi driver, right? And so I thought maybe, hey, this guy would have an idea if one wanted to find marijuana in this place where one could get it. And so I asked him if he knew and he was, uh, you know, he looked, we made eye contact like in the rear view mirror because he's driving, right? He's like in this chaos and so we're, we're sort of like talking. And so he looked at me though through the rear view mirror and we made that eye contact and he smiled. And he said that most, that marijuana is very hard to find there and that most people smoke hash. And so that like, sort of lit, lit up my, my eardrums because I had heard of hash, but I'd never actually smoked hash before. I knew it was something to do with weed, like it was some kind of weed, but I'd never actually done it before. Once in ninth grade, I had tried opium, which I wasn't sure if that was similar or not, but I'd never done hash, and so I was immediately intrigued, and I was, you know, like, uh, I'm, you know, of course I'm interested. And so he proceeded to tell me that hash was... It was the best hash in the world, he said, in Kathmandu, right? Which, arguably, between that and Morocco, is true. And I asked him if he if he knew where to, if if he knew where to get any, and he said that he had some. And so then, right? Okay, you have to be on guard, people, world travelers, because if a taxi driver like has it, then he you just have to be on weary because he might really try and overcharge you. So I was like put on guard a little bit by that, but. I asked if he would let me see it. And so then he fumbled up in the front, like as he's driving, we're driving through this chaos, and he hands me back this little bag that's wrapped up, and I ask him if I can open it, and he says yes, and I'm in the back seat. Again, we're driving through like Kathmandu, the capital, beep, 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 honk, honk, all this stuff all around us. And so I'm unwrapping this stuff, and I look into this bag, and, and by the way, as I unwrap it, aromatic, you know, the smell of marijuana just sort of fills the vehicle. And I look, and it's a, only a small amount, very small amount. And it's this brown, light brown, sort of pollinated looking piece of a, of a brick. Small, very small brick, like a very small, tiny corner chip of a brick, really. And so I was looking at it, and he started to tell me that there were three different kinds of hash, three grades of hash, right? And so again, you have to be wary because people, they'll try and basically sell you, sell you up. Like, oh yeah, I happen to have the greatest hash and so this is going to be so much money. That's why I'm charging you so much, blah, blah, blah. But he started to tell me and he was like, the, the worst hash, the third rate, because I asked him what the difference was, is like black, tarry, resonated, you know, like you, you can like roll it between your fingers sort of thing into slivers, into long slivers that you can then lay into a joint or something. And that first rate sort of just crumbles. It's like a block, it just easily turns into dust. And I made a comment to him because I had sort of felt on his, that's what had happened when I felt on his, like, oh, well, you know, this must be first rate hash. And he was like, yeah, that's my personal. Ah, and see, when he said that, then that made me feel reassured because he had been really cool up to that point. But, I, but then I just wasn't sure if he was maybe trying to gouge me. But no, it just turned out that he was just, he, you know, I smoke weed, he smokes hash. And so that was his personal hash that he was letting me look at. And he was taking the time to explain to me the different qualities of hash and everything. Because in Kathmandu, again, it's one of the world's best places in Nepal to get hash. And so I was then wanting to see if I could get it off him. And I asked him if I could, but he told me that it was his personal, which again, set me at ease, but also made me like want to get it because it's like, you know, okay, well, I know it's good now. Cause it's like, you know, your stuff. So what's up? Can I get some? And so, uh, he told me when we got to this hotel owned by Mamai, oh, and he was Sanjay or Sanjay, that was his name. And then Mamai, this place that we were going to this, uh, hostel that was in Tamil district. And so we, it was probably a 25, 30 minute drive through this I mean, just teeming city that was 
all the buildings between two and four stories, they all really look dirty and dilapidated with signs and wires everywhere and Nepalese and everything. But then eventually we turned onto into some sort of quarter of the city and the streets became like the cobblestone. And then I started to see signs in English and that was when I was like, oh, this must be Tamil district. And Sanji was like, yeah, this is this is basically it. And so we drove until we got, oh, and it was just crazy, you know, as you'll see in, in the video. We drove until we got to this hotel or hostel that he was talking about and parked the taxi again guys very good great chauffeur very good service gets my bag out of the back trunk and is carrying it in with the receptionist helps me get set up with a room seven dollars seven dollars for a nice one bedroom hotel room for this night that i'm going to be in tamil district and so it's on like the third floor we go up we put our stuff there and then he tells me after we put our stuff down that he's going to take me onto the rooftop so that I can meet Mamai, the owner, who's got the hash, right? And so I'm like, okay, cool, you know, and in the morning, right, I'm going to go to the monastery. So it's like, you know, it's all good. So after we put my stuff down, then I went up to the rooftop with Sanjay. And when you got up to the roof, it was really spectacular because up there, there's all these very thin, light, ornate fabrics like the Tibetan prayer flags sort of things that are hanging over creating a, a shade canopy but you can look beyond that and again you just see the the range of the himalayas the himalaya mountains and then you walk to the edge of the roof because this is like a four-story building and you can look out below and see the teeming tamil district right below and everything and so it was really really cool and so when we were on the rooftop he showed me there was a bar there and like like a shisha sort of lounge outdoor really nice posh very cool and there were these three guys sitting there nepalese guys one was sitting down and then the two were next to him he was like bigger built something like that bigger and then there were the two that were sitting next to him and so sanjay took me over and introduced me to the one that was sitting down on the couch who was like Mamai, the, the owner of the hotel, right? And he spoke good English too, but the other two guys didn't speak a word of English. It was just Sanjay, the taxi guy, and then Mamai, the owner of the hotel. And he was like, where are you from? And I, you know, I told him the USA, and he was like, oh, I got a brother in the USA, and good, big, very good English speaking. And so we're sitting there talking, and then uh, Sanjay and him start discussing something in Nepalese, and then Mamai turns to me, and he's like, so you, you, you've never smoked hash, right? And, you know, obviously they were talking about that. And so then I told him, like, no, but I, I want to try it. And so then Mamai was like, okay, well, let's try some. And so then Mamai, the owner of this fucking hotel, he pulls out, like, this block of hash, you know, because they've already got this big shisha pipe on the table, right, before we, like, came in. But then underneath, he's got this big block of, like, this pollinated brown hash. And again, Sanjay looks at me, he's like, best in the city. You know, like he's telling me, like, because it's the personal stuff is his same stuff. Like, right, he gets it from Sanjay, who gets it from whoever. And so I'm about to smoke this really good hash from the shisha pipe. And I've never smoked hash or shisha pipe before. And so I'm sitting there on this rooftop in Kathmandu with like this Indian instrumentals playing. And it's like evening time. The sun's starting to go down. The sun's setting. The Himalayas in the background, like really cool, epic stuff, man. I'm just hanging up there with these four Nepalese guys. Really cool. Two can't, two I can't speak with except, you know, the language, universal language of laughter and, and smiles. But then two I can, Sanjay and Mamai. 
And so Mamai, uh, he packs some hash into the into this pipe with some tobacco. And he passes it to me and tells me to take a hit. And so I knew from when I was young that you don't hit weed the same way that you hit tobacco. Because when I was a little kid and I was smoking a black and mild one time, I like took a big rip like it was a blunt and almost died coughing for 10 minutes. So I knew when he gave me the shisha pipe and it was tobacco and hash in it not to like take a rip like it was a weed pipe so i got it and lit it and then like took sort of like a small to medium sort of style hit like and then like tried to like pull it in but even that like i was coughing and sputtering and everything from the tobacco and all that and then the other guy started laughing at me and they were saying stuff in nepalese and i'm like slobbering and all this stuff and even before I could finish like wiping my mouth, like I, I start feeling this wave, this wave come over me of euphoria from from this this rip of hash I just took. But I was but I was asking Sanji like what what are, you know like what do you say you know because Mama said something was laughing and, and uh, Sanji told me that he said I hit it like a weed pipe, you know because I, I didn't know how to hit it. I never hit it before. It's they they just given it to me to hit. I hadn't seen it demonstrated. And so then Mama took the pipe. And then he uh, he proceeded to hit it, and he hit it like you know you're supposed to, like a bunch of small hits, and he would like inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, like th this whole little rhythm, this thing, right, showing me breathing out of his nose, puffing his mouth, breathing out of his nose, and so then I saw how I was supposed to do it, and obviously, you know, the second time I got it, it was much better than the first, but even those two hits of this Nepalese Kathmandu light brown pollinated hash had me on a tidal wave of just like so i was i was it was all i could do to just sort of maintain myself right and stay affable and not just like lose myself in in this abyss that i was on the verge of cascading into and so i was there for i don't know 20 30 minutes you know trying to hang in they were talking i was sort of throwing in when i could until sanjay finally told me that he had to go right this guy's got a family he's got a wife and kid at home so he told me that he was going to go and in the morning that he would pick me up at nine and then take me to the monastery and i would start living with the monks and so you know i managed to get up and through the haze of hash thank him and Mamai for their wonderful hospitality and treatment since I had been in Nepal for, you know, only less than three or four hours by this point. And already I was in a wonderful hostel in the middle of Tamil District with a great room. It wasn't a hostel, a hotel in Tamil District with my own room on this rooftop lounge that I just got to smoke this world-class hash with with the owner that's you know a really cool guy and the next morning i'm going to get you know another ride up into uh the temple where i'm going to be living at and helping the monks out so that's where we left it right i basically stayed on the rooftop watched the sun go down went around the edges looking down at all of the people and the teeming masses down below the himalaya range out in front and then eventually once i wasn't quite so inebriated i went back to my room i didn't even eat dinner and i just fell on my bed and passed out and that was it until the next morning and so the next episode will be about going to the temple getting to the temple when sanjay comes picks me up take me to the temple so this video and all the videos on this channel are only made for ashley quest eyes and i love her so much i love her so so much so please just subscribe because if you subscribe then we get more people the more people the quicker we get her to see it in the quicker that she can become free she is such a wonderful, a lovely human being, and the world is worse off without her. So please just know that all of this content that is on this channel is only done for her. Everything I do is for her. She is my devotion, my light, my life, my son. I revolve around her. So this is all for love, and please support her freedom so that she doesn't have to live for 40 or 50 years in a single cell with like 50 other women in one toilet on a concrete floor with not enough space to lie down without touching you know it's it's just horrific so this is all being done for ashley i love you ashley and thank you for watching we will see you next week free ashley